what drove you to write about Grace? I think two things. Um, firstly, was my experience of Grace through her because it was something she very, really believed in and I saw that what she did and the way she was with so many people um, kind of really could transform lives and change people and I still have people kind of coming up to me and talking about it and what she did, the idea of like forgiveness when it really just seems impossible and actually yeah. absurd. Yeah. Um, loving people who are just complete jerks. Um, like she'd always be like, I'd be like, oh, man, what do I do about this? person at work, like someone who's really undermining me and treating me like just, they were just like crap, passive aggressive or aggressive aggressive yeah. or whatever. And she'd be like, just try to like love them. I'm like, mom, are you serious right now? So, but she was all, it's the sense of like, it seems implausible. It's so far beyond eye for an eye. Yeah. But then what would it do to people if you do that? When, when in cases when you show mercy, yeah. um, uh, not merit, and when a case when you do things for people who don't necessarily deserve it, and I think that's so crucial and wild. And it, it's not to say there's no you shouldn't have any boundaries, sure. Like, uh, and maybe we'll get to forgiveness, but it's not to say that you allow anyone to do anything and just a whole culture of impunity. But the other reason, um, <clears throat> but you bet that that forgiveness can be astonishing. So the other reason I want to write about it is because I've written so and thought so much about awe. Yeah. And I know this is something you think about too, but it's, you know, that, that sense of being, feeling small in the natural world, how psychologically healthy that is. Yeah. That sense of being over overcome, overwhelmed, like struck by something and realising that there's a great, massive, marvellous universe well beyond us. Just how psychologically healthy that is and how that had really kept me strong through some of the darkest times of my life. And there's um, Dacher Keltner from the University of California who's written about awe and he's done a lot of studies over the years. Did a study recently of about 3,000 or was it about 2,600 people in across 26 countries to find out what was the most common experience of awe. And um, you would imagine, like, what would you have said if it was? I don't know, a mountain or, you know, yeah. some, some natural Ocean. phenomenon, a Grand Canyon kind of a thing. Yeah, that's what I would say too. And so across all kind of histories, demographics, cultures, dialects, whatever, he found that the most common experience of it was actually seeing it in another person, in mm. another human being, acts of moral beauty, of great courage, yeah. generosity, decency, um, people overcoming obstacles and hurdles, um, people overcoming things in life. And I was really struck by that and I was wanted to explore it, like, what does that actually look like um, when you do something that someone else doesn't deserve? Like what impact does it have on you? What does it have on them? What what does it mean for people witnessing it? Yeah. And, yeah, to me it's the very best of who we are. I was just thinking about that when I was reading this Lincoln book because there's this story Lincoln's a sort of an up-and-coming lawyer gets chosen to be on this case. It's the biggest case of his life. Yeah. And it ends up changing venues and so the company, it's a, big company, they bring on another lawyer. Yeah. And that lawyer sees Lincoln as this country bumpkin, basically kicks him off the case. He still gets paid, but he kicks him off the case. Uh, he, he calls him like a gorilla to his face. He just sees him as like a, just a buffoon. Yeah. And uh, every night, Lincoln, Lincoln decides to attend the trial anyway. He wants to learn from it. Every night, all the lawyers meet in the hotel lobby to discuss the case. They never include Lincoln. It's like the humiliation of his career. Right. And, you know, like a decade and a half later, that lawyer is who Lincoln chooses as his secretary of war. Huh. And the right man at the right time. And like when I think of things that strike me with, oh, yeah, it's not, it's not these brilliant works of art. It's not, you know, somebody did this athletic feat that I can't imagine. It's, it's the, the sense of self and the empathy and the forgiveness to be like this person who humiliated me, mm. who treated me like absolute garbage yeah. is the right man for this thing. And I won't get in their way. And not only will I not get in their way, I will be their advocate. When you, you think of like, yeah, like when you think of Gandhi or you think of Jesus on the cross, forgive them father for they know not what they do. Like moments of, of that sort of almost superhuman yeah. grace. Yeah. 
is. is one of the most incredible and powerful forces in existence. And it changes everyone who witnesses it. Yes. It's any of the scientific studies I've seen into that just show people are much more likely to do it themselves. And yes. a lot of those studies are on moral elevation in uh, in workforces. And if you see and find out, not in a way that trumpets it, hey, guess what, guys, I'm a great philanthropist. <laughs> yeah, Here's sure. my name across some wall. Or, But when you find out, that someone in a position of leadership has been, you know, quietly sacrificing time or money or caring for someone in a way they didn't necessarily need to. That can really shift a whole culture of a company. Yes. Yeah, when when you are the angel that a person needs yeah. in a scenario. Yeah. And it, it, in many cases, was not only difficult, but it wasn't in your interest. There's something yeah. absolutely incredible about yeah, that. Yeah, and that's... That's really interesting because a lot of people see grace as something nice and yeah. about being polite and not quite a hallmark card, but something kind of pretty and easy. And it is everyone appreciates it, celebrates it as it's happening. It's lovely. Yes. It's like puppies and Kleenex tissues, right? But this is about something that's really hard to do. Mm hmm. You know, to forgiving people can be incredibly hard to do. And you don't just do it once. You sometimes have to just do it every single day, yes. you know. Um, and sometimes does it cost yourself? Right. How many times should I forgive my brother? Seven mm -hmm. times? No. 70 times? No. 70 times seven. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. And just the incredibleness of that. Yeah. It's probably, I think, that is the greatest concept of Christianity, that yeah. grace and forgiveness. And great, and at the heart of that is grace is, is done nothing. You've done you've done nothing to deserve it. Yes. Well, well, the idea that to me, my understanding of Christianity is basically this idea: of you were forgiven for everything. Yep. And so you were so you were given a gift. Yes. That's which right. means that you in turn have to give. Yeah. Exactly. And that that sort of obligation or that indebtedness. Yep. Like you're a shitty person. You've done shitty things. <laughs> So the idea that you get to to hold that above someone else, that you get to hold something over someone else yeah. for having made a mistake yeah. or done right. you wrong or done the world wrong. Yeah, you owe me, buddy. That's a luxury that you're actually not entitled to. Yeah, which is amazing. Yes. And, yeah, it doesn't actually make sense. You know, and look, I have grown up a – as we talked about with my mother who talked a lot about forgiveness, growing up like really being exposed to the idea that you just, you, just, you forgive and forgive and forgive. Then as a reporter, I've done a lot of work on domestic abuse um, and violence and sexual assault. And I also looked at um, domestic violence in faith communities yeah. and could see how that was weaponized yes. by abusers um, and sometimes by like structures to, to tell women especially, don't leave, just put up with it, you forgive again and again and again. And, and that's where I think we need to be cautious, that forgiveness doesn't mean, um, okay, I don't need to protect myself now or I don't, I don't need to move away from you. Um, forgiveness can sometimes be cutting ties yeah. and walking away from. Well, first off, it's the idea that you have competing and sometimes conflicting obligations to yourself, to your children, that's right. To the person that comes after you, but also I, I think what as I just did this book on justice and and I think it's been helpful for me to understand there's the justice system is something apart from and separate yeah. that we is a societal invention right. that is required for us all to live together and function in a large group, and then our personal sense of justice yes. is something very different. So yes. so you forgiving the person is not mutually exclusive with mm -hmm. them being held accountable for that thing. And them being held accountable and how they're held accountable and the whole system built around it is based on the statistics and you know tr the, the, the experience and, and what society understands has to happen to yes. protect future generations mm -hmm. and to deter other people, et cetera. That's very different than what you as the individual ought to do. That is really important. It is not separate to justice. It's yes. not separate to the consequences of justice. Um, and it is very much about what you need as an individual. I got really interested in um, restorative justice when I was writing this book. And um, the idea being that you bring together, as you'd be familiar, you bring together the person the harm's been caused to, the person that caused the harm. You have a mediator who's very experienced, who spent a year working out whether these people can get together. And basically it's it's the victims who are really asking for these kinds of justice systems because yeah. they often go through a court. They've never even had to give a victim impact statement or to, they want to talk directly to the person that caused them harm. But, again, there needs to be remorse yeah. and you can't have any expectation of forgiveness. Yeah. 
So sometimes they want to know just a piece of information. Sometimes they want to know what's the last things, what are the last words my daughter said right. before she died? What are they? So, so this kind of complicated but really quite amazing process actually because when it works, you know, these two people staring at each other, trying to recognise harm caused and each other's humanity, um, it can also, it can allow for the possibility of redemption but it also can really free the, the victim. And there was one woman I spoke to called Debbie McGrath and she her husband oh no, sorry, and her brother was killed when she was 24, he was 20 and it was killed by a, a friend who just shot him one night after they'd been playing at the pub yeah. and killed him. No explanation has ever been given and she found herself, she was then heavily pregnant, consumed with rage about this. Sure. She was so furious about it that consumed in a way that it took over her mind, it took over her body. She put on a lot of, of weight. She um, got diabetes. She got insomnia. Her father got very ill. It just infected this whole community as so as, as these, these um, in, incidents and attacks and horrible things often do. And she told me that she was at a point where she would, like, look at a sunset and she would see um, – she would be thinking about ways to murder this guy. <laughs> like it was just so – she couldn't free herself from it. And one day she sat down opposite him. Finally, in a restorative justice moment, and she just was able to say to him, this is what you did to me. Yeah. This is what happened to my body. This is what happened to my mind. This is what you did to my father. This is what you did to my brother's son who never had a dad growing up. And she said there was a point at which during this that she sat up and because she instinctively, because she felt like something had been lifted from her. Yeah. And she just looked around to th and realised it, it just felt that way. And she said that she had put everything that he did to her in a suitcase and left it at his feet and it yeah. was his. And after that she was freed. Yeah. She goes, I don't know if that was forgiveness, I don't know what it was, but I now, the, her, her worst fear was that she wouldn't be able to love again because love it for her was associated with loss. And she had grandkids and now she said to me, I can I can love my grandson and like that, moments like that. Well, because I was struck you had the, the sort of the land acknowledgement at the beginning mm -hmm. of the book and mm -hmm. that's a thing I've seen all over Australia it's not really an American thing. No. We're very much in denial of our past. Yeah. And it, it's not just a singular denial, but a sort of an ongoing perpetuation of that denial. And I was mm -hmm. so I was struck by the choice. What 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 does that mean to you? How does how does that connect to grace? So it's an acknowledgement that right now we are on the land owned by the Eora people. Um the Gadigal people of the Eora, Eora Nation, which was not ours and which belonged to First Nations people before we came. Yeah. And we've had a horrible and difficult history uh, that it's taken us as a country a long time to reckon with. Yeah. The massacres, the poisoning, the dispossession, the stolen generations. And I spoke to a, a, a few quite a few members of the Stolen Generations for my book being taken away from your families and being told that being um, that you basically have to be white. You speak your own language, you'll have your mouth washed out with soap or with poison, uh, with cleaning detergent. You um, are, are like stripped of all of your identity, of your, of your family, of your culture, of your language, and you they were supposed to be trained usually in, to do domestic work. Um, and the trauma that goes on from that generation to generation that we're still living with today. Um, what happened, the fact that so many um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people came, to, came together as elders and said we want to have a Makarata coming together after a period of struggle and walking together to a better future. To me, the grace in that, is astonishing yes. and undeserved. So, that, totally. so we have a National Sorry Day, which is a day which recognised the first report into bringing them home into the stolen generations. And a former Prime Minister a few years ago said, okay, it's one thing to say sorry, but what you guys really need to do is forgive. Like yeah. That's the really hard thing. That's the really important thing here. And their response was, of a lot of elders, was, get in the bin, like you can't have a powerful white man telling us, 
literally is the prime minister, that the onus is on us to forgive. Yeah. That's our burden. You owe me. Yeah, when you haven't done anything really to fix it. Sure. And so that was a big issue in the coming up to the voice vote, which we had at the end of last year, which was um, about whether we had a um, Indigenous voice to parliament, uh, just an advisory group that would advise the parliament on what each bit of legislation would mean for First Nations people. 